Hello. Welcome to the Pirate History Podcast. My name is Matt. Thank you for listening. I'd like to begin today from the point of view of an average London woman. Not any particular woman, just kind of an amalgamation of lower to middle class womanhood from London. In the history of pirates and piracy, women's stories are few and far between. There are a few exceptional women that push their way onto the front page of pirate history, but they're exceptions. Even in our era of printing houses and the birth of periodical journalism and expanded literacy rates, particularly among women, women's stories can be hard to come by. Not upper-class women, of course. Their diaries and correspondences are a major source for the period. But for lower-class women, you know, working-class women, there isn't a lot to go on, and pirates fall into the working class. So most of the women that are active in the story of pirates and piracy don't appear on stage. They were there, to be sure, in Port Royal and Tortuga, later on in Nassau and Charleston, and of course, London. But their stories weren't usually written down. So when the women in this story today elbow their way on stage and arguably change the course of pirate history forever, we're going to jump at the opportunity to shine the spotlight on them. This is episode 202, A Coruña. Let's explore who this amalgam of a London woman might be. The first thing to recognize about this imaginary Londoner is that she probably wasn't originally from London. The majority of the city was made up of people from elsewhere in England. There are two main reasons for this. First of all, more and more London was where jobs were to be found, especially for women, especially for young women, who may be looking for an independent income. I looked at a map of the West Country and picked out a relatively small town at random and landed on Brixham. Brixham is a fishing town on the southern coast of England and also the permanent home of the replica of the Golden Hind, Francis Drake's vessel, so, you know, that's cool. But if you were a woman from Brixham, you might be able to find a job there, but probably not. The local gentry only had so many positions for maids or kitchen staff available, and most of those jobs were at this point almost all virtually hereditary. As a woman from Brixham in Brixham, your income was probably going to rely on a fishing boat. And that means a man. Your father until you got married, and then your husband, but more likely a family of men. Your family. Brothers and sons and nephews and uncles all working the same boat or the same small fleet of boats. Now you would have been a part of that business. Making and mending nets and clothing. Processing fish for sale, preparing meals, raising kids, doing all of the jobs that the men were not doing while they were out fishing. And, of course, this holds for those not in fishing villages as well. Farmers and those raising sheep. This was just what small-town life was like. And it was generally accepted to be the status quo by most. But, for those who might be looking for an option B, there was London. In London, there were a ton of households that needed maids and cooks and all manner of domestic duties. Take William Dampier's wife, Judith. She had been a maid prior to Dampier's return, but once he got back and once his book started selling, Judith went from a maid to employing several maids. London was where nearly all economic mobility was to be found in England, so there were domestic jobs for women. But there were also jobs for women in the wool trades, you know, spinning or sewing or dyeing, manufacturing jobs. The work was harder in these jobs than a maid, but there were also benefits to working a labor gig rather than a domestic job. The likelihood of assault, both physical and sexual, was smaller in these industrial trades. That's a real problem for this group of young women living in the homes of rich and powerful men. At times, it was almost an accepted part of that world. Like, look, if you didn't want to get beaten and groped, you'd have gotten married back in Brixham. Clearly, you're just some hussy who's asking for it anyway. So we're going to hypersexualize your industry in cheap Halloween costumes till the end of time. 
So all of that explains why there were so many people coming into the city of London. But the other reason that most people in London weren't from London was the death rate. The city of London was amazingly unhealthy. Most people emptied their chamber pots right into the street. The Thames was an open sewer, and the growing industrial sector had not yet heard the word pollution. There were these pigs, often wearing bells, that you were supposed to feed kitchen scraps to, as kind of a communal garbage disposal. And then, come festival time, it would be butchered and shared out to the community. Now, this was common practice all over Europe, but in London... What do you imagine the probability is that one of those pigs happened upon a syphilitic corpse, or a plague-ridden corpse, or later on a choleric corpse, and just went to town on it? Would you, knowing that was a possibility, eat that bacon? London was disgusting. So many people were dying in London that even though there was this wave of people coming into the city from all over England, it was difficult to keep the city's population from declining. More children died in London than reached adulthood. And most of these women that were in London for jobs were fully aware that if they got pregnant and wanted to keep the child, they had to leave the city if that kid were to have any hope of survival. So most of the women in London and... You know, a lot of this is applicable to men as well, but most of the people in London were either temporary residents or recent transplants. And most of those were looking for a way out. Often that was the purpose of going to London. If you were dissatisfied at your life, wherever it is you came from, go to London, earn enough money, and then buy a little cottage somewhere out in the country. Of course, that rarely really worked out. So for a very few women in London, it must have seemed like a godsend when one of the men in their lives, be it a husband or a father or a son or a brother, when he fell into an amazing job opportunity. When he was hired to sail for Spanish expedition shipping. Recall the terms under which these sailors were hired. It was offering the best wage of any voyage in England. They got hazard pay and... They got a stake in whatever prize money they might stumble across. Now this was supposed to come from treasure hunting. This whole voyage was funded by and based on the salvage from La Nuestra Señora. But let's not beat around the bush here. This fleet was very well armed, and this was a time of war. If they were to happen upon any fat, rich French prizes out on the blue, well... Who's to say they might just earn a bit more money? Now, this wasn't a privateer voyage, but the terms looked almost like those found on a privateer vessel. Not exactly, but there's an interesting alternate history that I can't get out of my head. If this expedition had gone according to plan, it could have precipitated a change in English maritime culture based on the codes of the buccaneers. Those buccaneer codes led to so many successes for England in the West that had this voyage succeeded, we might have just seen a more fair and equitable pay for all of the sailors in the British Empire. Hell, that might have ended the golden age of piracy before it even began. But of course, the Spanish expedition was not going to go as planned. Now, all of those excellent wages were usually paid not to the sailors on board, but back home. While the men were away, their pay was not paid to those on board, but sent back home. This was typical on most naval voyages. Now, that was supposed to be happening from moment one for the Spanish expedition. As soon as a sailor signed his name to his contract, he was on the job. And at first, everything went according to plan. The men were singing their shanties while they worked away the days, getting their expedition ready to sail. But before we set out with the Spanish expedition, let's recall the players. The flagship of the Spanish expedition fleet, Charles II, was fast, agile, and bristling with guns. She was a state-of-the-art frigate, the best that money could buy. And I should note here that her name, Charles II, 
was after the king of Spain, not the Stuart monarch. In Spanish sources, it's called Carlos II. The flagship carried the admiral of the fleet, an Irish mariner who sailed under Spanish colors for years in his career, named Arthur Bourne. Bourne was a drunk, a Jacobite, and none too fond of the English. Still, I suppose war makes for strange bedfellows. The flag captain, the captain of the flagship, was John Strong. He was that sailor who'd sailed under William Phipps on the voyage to La Nuestra Señora. And directly under Captain Strong, we find Henry Every, the first mate. An experienced navyman who was on a fast track to the middle class until, that is, English naval fortunes turned in the war. This voyage was to be his way back onto that path of social advancement. And I'd like to mention two other men on board Charles II. There was an old sea dog named William May, not to be confused with William Mason, and there was a young man of 18 years named William Bishop. This was William Bishop's first voyage at sea. He was fresh-faced and handsome, and later on, he would say that he was forced into service on the Spanish expedition, although that's heavily disputed. Now, we have good records of all of the officers in the fleet, but there are only three names I want to mention right now. All three were second mates on board their respective vessels. And actually, it's worth looking at what a second mate was. Often, they were third in the chain of command, but not necessarily always. See, there were frequently more than one second mates on board a ship, and they had different jobs. The medical officer was often a second mate, the quartermaster, a navy quartermaster, not a pirate quartermaster, remember, but they were usually second mates as well. Then there was the pilot, who was also a second mate, and he was usually the officer third in command. But the one job that every second mate shared was leading the watch on board. It wasn't uncommon to have three second mates on board, often medical officer, pilot, and quartermaster, so that each one could lead a different shift of the watch. Their main duty was keeping an eye out for enemy vessels, or storms, or pirates. William Dampier was a second mate on board the Dove, serving as a navigator. Aboard the James, you have a man named Thomas Druitt, although Druitt will be raised to a first mate before long. But then, aboard the Charles II, you have a David Cray. And it's Cray that you should make a mental note of here. He served in that quartermaster role. You know, kind of a human relations officer on board, keeping the crew as happy and productive as possible. These were the officers, among others, of course, who were overseeing the preparations for the Spanish expedition. And they were, with a few exceptions, good at their jobs. And we can say that with some confidence, thanks to the confidence of James Hublon. He's the Hublon brother most directly involved with Spanish expedition shipping. It was his baby. And on the 1st of August, 1693, James Hublon paid a personal visit to the North London dockyards and the now-completed Charles II. He was there to appraise the ship and her crew, and he liked what he saw. The men were sober, they were working diligently, and morale appeared very high on board. Of course, morale would have been high on that day because Hublon brought the men their first pay. All of their wages earned so far, depending on when they signed their contracts, and one month at sea paid in advance. Then they were given notice that the ship was to sail first thing in the morning. On 2nd August, 1693, Charles II left London and made her way down the Thames. It was exciting to finally put her in the water, but this wasn't yet the big bon voyage. Charles II met up with the rest of the fleet at the Downs a few days later, and then it was all hurry up and wait. They were waiting for supplies to be delivered, like food and water and gunpowder, and they waited there a full 23 days. This was a pleasant time for the crew, I was fascinated to learn that it was common for wives to accompany their husbands on this leg of the voyage, from whatever their port of call might be, to the Downs. And it happened here as well. There were a bunch of women aboard while the fleet waited at the Downs, 
There was even a host of bum boats making their way from ship to ship carrying, you know, tobacco and wine and some decent food, maybe something a little stronger. And the people on board took advantage of these supplies. Of course, the single men had ample opportunities for companionship as well. Those bumboats carried prostitutes, a lot of them. I mean, think about it. You've got a ship full of young men who had just been paid that were stuck in one place for weeks at a time. Where would you ply your trade? Historian E.T. Fox points out the official ban on bringing working women aboard any naval vessel. But there were ways around this prohibition. One tactic the men used was yelling their names overboard to passing women on board those bum boats. Women who would subsequently come aboard claiming to be the wife of gunner's mate so-and-so. Those ladies would spend a few days or even weeks on deck draining the men's pocketbooks. This wasn't, you know, fooling anybody, but the officers didn't usually care. They were just as likely to partake. Plus, it's a fool move to deny a bunch of young men the one reason for which a lot of them had put to sea in the first place. And now that I think about it, that might explain the presence of so many wives on board the Charles II. I mean, if your husband was going to be sitting in that syphilis-riddled cesspool for God knows how long you might just want to be there to keep an eye on him and remind him what he had to come home to. But all the while, the crew and their wives were getting to know each other. They were idling their days away with easy work and pleasurable company. It was a fine old time, plus, for all of those 23 days, they were earning wages at sea. But then, disaster struck. On 25 August a small fleet of navy ships appeared and ordered Charles II to strike sail. The officers grappled her and boarded the Spanish expedition flagship. Apparently, someone back at Whitehall finally thought to question the wisdom of giving an Irish Jacobite command of a powerful private naval force. Remember, King William had just returned from his campaign in the Williamite War. John Churchill was still over in Ireland, mopping up Jacobite rebels. Admiral O'Borne was not to be trusted. He was accused of at least suspected treason and clapped in irons and arrested formally. Then they took O'Borne over to the Navy flagship and just kind of sailed off. Now, I do fully suspect some behind-the-scenes shenanigans here. There's a ton of money in the Spanish expedition, and there were still swirling rings of court factions vying for control. All of this feels very cloak and dagger. We don't really know what was happening. The government was super hush-hush about this whole affair. But powerful forces did come to O'Born's defense, and he was eventually set free. It's... Unclear whether or not he sailed with the Spanish expedition in the end. Sources differ on the matter. It looks to me, though, like he probably did not. And that caused problems for the Spanish expedition. After all, Admiral Arthur O'Born, or Don Arturo O'Bean, was the Spanish expedition's Spanish connection. He was supposed to facilitate all of their dealings with Spain, and now it... Looks like most probably he was not there. John Strong was given command of the fleet, but still, they waited. A few days passed, and word arrived that the fleet could set sail. So the women were finally sent home, and the fleet finally left England on the 8th of September, 1693. Now, I'll note that once they left England, the fleet flew the flag of Spain. It wasn't completely out of the ordinary, they were on the Spanish expedition at all. This was a mission for the King of Spain. They were to bring guns to the West Indies aboard a ship named after Charles II of Spain. Still, it sat wrong with some of the men. Still, they were getting paid, and they had a leisurely two-week cruise to the port of Acaruña in Spain. The Channel, though, can be a tricky bit of business in September. And rather than the two weeks it should have taken them, it took the fleet almost five 
months to reach the coast of Spain. Now, I found this difficult to believe the first time I heard it, even with adverse winds. But all of the sources do bear this out, and a number of reputable historians back up this claim, including E.T. Fox and Angus Constam and Stephen Johnson. Everyone agrees with this assessment. Whatever trials and tribulations they may have faced in those five months, we know that the fleet did finally reach A Coruña, in Spain, in early January 1694. Now, A Coruña is a port city in northwest Spain, and it's one of the busiest port cities in the region even today. So much of the Atlantic coast of the Iberian Peninsula is Portuguese that this port in A Coruña is the best and last stop for a lot of ships coming from northern Europe to reach Spain. English sailors at the time called A Coruña the Groin. Partly this was a play on words, given that the two words sounded similar in pronunciation at the time. But partly it was a description about how they felt about A Coruña. They did not care for the place. And the Spanish expedition was going to be there for a long, long time. Since this was to be an international voyage, an English fleet, English sailors, on a mission for the King of Spain they had to get special permissions in writing from the Spanish Admiralty. And these permissions were not forthcoming. Now, this may have had to do with Admiral O'Born and his Spanish connections. He was probably no longer there. At the very least, he was recently arrested on suspicion of treason. There were a bunch of conspiracy theories that this whole voyage was somehow intended to be a Spanish move against England that despite their reliance in the war, the Spanish were preparing to betray the English in favor of King James. Now, this is almost certainly not true, but it does beg the question why the Spanish were so reluctant to send those written permissions to the Spanish expedition. Perhaps it was just incompetence. The Spanish government was not at their best during this era. We have discussed the network of Austrian royalty and corrupt officials who were running the Spanish government into the ground. Perhaps they just couldn't get their act enough together to deal with the Spanish expedition. Regardless, this fleet was left to rot in the Spanish sun. And nobody even to this day has unearthed any real evidence on what was happening here. The fleet was just stuck there. So they waited. And they waited. And they waited for a whole month. They waited with no sign of the papers showing up. And this was not the pleasant idleness they had enjoyed at the Downs. This was boring. It was dull. It was irritating. And around the 1st of February, 1694, the men on board the Spanish expedition really began to grumble about it. See, on long voyages... Wages were typically paid every six months. The last time that the men on board the Spanish expedition had been paid was the 1st of August, 1693, and February marks six months since their last payday. They'd only made it about 600 nautical miles, a voyage that should have taken them two weeks, but still, they had been at sea for six long months, and there was no pay. So the men were grumbling. They were stuck there in port within sight of at least half a dozen Spanish brothels, but they had not been paid. It had been a full five months since any of them had seen a woman, be it their wives or those ladies at the Downs, so they were getting antsy, and none of them were getting paid. The officers, on the other hand, had full pockets. They could enjoy all of the pleasures that A Coruña had to offer. The captain of the James, a Captain Gibson, was an alcoholic and a patron of all of those brothels. He spent his days in a haze of drink and women, and his men, meanwhile, were eating scant rations with little drink and no women. Eventually, a cadre of sailors from the Spanish expedition disobeyed orders and went ashore to confront the 
someone. Reports differ on what actually happened here. One account tells of a dozen or so men going to the office of a John Fishy. He's the man who was supposed to see to their pay, their agent in Akarunya. And that report has those dozen or so men asking him politely for their wages. The other report has a gang of sailors barging in on Captain Gibson's favorite establishment, only to see how the captain had been living, you know, plush pillows, incense burning and beautiful, nude Spanish women feeding him dates. That report tells of a riot of theft and rape and violence. Now, it's hard to tell which story is true. Perhaps both stories are true. Regardless, though, all of the men who went ashore in A Coruña were arrested and thrown in a Spanish cell without trial. It was an outrage, and the men who were still on board the Spanish expedition were furious at their treatment. Back in England, though, all of those women we introduced earlier begin to finally come into play. The wives and mothers of the Spanish expedition were also upset at the lack of pay. They had contracts in their hands that they could read that stated all of them could expect payment every six months and that pay, six months in, was not forthcoming. Some of them had learned that their men had been thrown into Spanish jail cells with no hope of release, and they were angry. So these women also decided to cause a bit of a scene, but not in some Spanish brothel. Instead, a large mob of these women attached to the Spanish expedition marched on the home of James Hublon. I wonder if William Dampier's wife, Judith, was among them. Either way, William Dampier is silent on the issue. But this demonstration at James Hublon's home did get noticed. That mob of women gathered outside his house and were apparently in the process of beating down his door when James Hublon finally came out to meet with them. Now remember, this is not Downton Abbey. This was 1694. These were West Country sailors' wives. They were not refined women. They had rough hands and rough tongues. A delicate little merchant like James Hublon was not ready for the torrent of vitriol that came his way. They were screaming obscenities and threats at him. Finally, when James Hublon was able to figure out what they want when the women demanded the pay that their husbands and fathers and sons were owed, James Hublon responded in the stupidest possible way. James Hublon told this mob of angry West Country women in London that their men were in the service of the King of Spain now, that they should look to Carlos II for their money. And then he said, and this is a quote, James Hublon told these women that, quote, Carlos II could pay them or hang them as he pleased. End quote. And then he went inside. So there you are. One of these women in a mob that had just had a door slammed in your face by this soft little merchant. That son of a bitch who had the nerve to say your men belonged to the king of Spain. So what do you do in that situation? I mean, there's a real possibility that all of you march down to the local pitchfork and torch emporium and string this guy up. But then on the way, that's when you see it. Maybe you're passing a newsstand, and out of the corner of your eye, there it is. There is your answer. On the cover of a newspaper, there's an expose. Over in the colonies, the governor of New York just hosted Thomas II, a pirate, in the grandest possible style. Every man of Thomas II's crew was in possession of at least a thousand pounds sterling, and their wives were busy feasting and dancing in the governor's mansion. That may have been when an idea began to hatch. Now, of course, none of it really happened that way. There was a moment when it looked like James Hublon, after slamming the door in those women's faces, may have been in real danger, but that danger fizzled. 
Over the coming weeks, a number of civil suits were brought against him, but those fizzled as well. But it was during these weeks that news of Thomas II and his arrival in New York and his fabulous prize at the Gate of Tears was filtering back to London. I just can't believe that what follows is a coincidence. Next time, we're going to follow a few of those women to a Coruña, and then we're going to follow the men of the Spanish expedition when their thoughts turn to mutiny. I'd like to thank everybody for listening. I'd like to thank everybody who has helped to support the show, all of our patrons on Patreon, everybody who has left us ratings or reviews wherever you listen to the show, and everybody who has recommended us. You all make this possible. Thank you. Our theme music was, as always, The Old Captain by the fantastic band Brillig. If you haven't checked them out yet, you absolutely should do so. You can find them at brillig.com.au. That's B-R-I-L-L-I-G dot com dot A-U. After you're done over there, why not check out our website at piratehistorypodcast.com. As always, and most importantly, thank you for listening.